Last week, we began a series called Lost. And uh, Pastor Terry, if you had the chance to be here, it was a great time. Uh, and if you ha- didn't get a chance to check that out, please go back onto our website uh, or our YouTube channel. And we do have that to watch uh, and so you can catch up with us. But So we began a series called Lost. Um, some of you guys might remember the uh, TV series a few years ago called Lost. Uh, it, and it's not necessarily based on that, but just to give you a mental picture of what Lost can be. We have a lot of things that could be lost. Last week, we really dove into the idea about what it was to be lost with the uh, prodigal son and, and how that he came back to the father. And there was two sides of it that re- Pastor Terry really began to dive into. And he dove into the one side that says, hey, the one, the one guy said, I want my inheritance. I got to leave. And he was lost because he knew his way home. But then he also talked about the brother who was lost because he said, listen to the dad and said, I've been here the whole time. And he began to uh, be challenged with uh, revenge and challenged with anger and frustration. And so he had a lot of questions. As, as we begin to dive into that, one thing that began to um, hit my mind and be, I began to think about was we, how they begin to think towards those situations and what it is the way we think about the word lost or what it is the way we think about God or the way we think about being a Christian. So today I began to uh, challenge my mind and to begin to think what it is to lose your mind. And so it's funny. So I, I, I begin to study this out and I begin to listen to, and there was, there's a really famous comedian who, who put out this tweet that became very viral. And he, he, he quoted like this. He says, losing my mind sounds so pessimistic. I prefer the term winning my insanity. Now, I'm not calling anybody insane here today. And as a matter of fact, I don't agree with this statement one bit. And I'll tell you why. Because what happens so often, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the big enchilada today. I'm going to talk about our thoughts and our minds. And I'm going to talk a little bit about mental illness. And I'm going to talk a little bit about stuff that the church sometimes forgets about. And the world has not given us a good quality antidote to work on these things and begin to practice with our minds. As a matter of fact, the New Testament begins to talk about it more than 100 times in the King James. It says, talks about thoughts. More than uh, 20 times it says the word mind. Uh, uh, more than more than uh, what's, we got chapters after chapters that talks about guarding our heads up with the salvation helmet, uh, protecting our mind. We see chapters and chapters talking about the antidote to the way we think, the way we process stuff, the way we the way we function in things. And we hear all the time in the uh, in church about the the idea of sin and the idea of oh all you got to do is get rid of your sin. But wait a second. What about the, what causes those sins? What is, what is it that might get in between it and give us an antidote so that we don't end up over here? How do we begin to fight this battle? I mean, people are dying right and left. People are killing, killing themselves. I mean, I've seen suicide after suicide and not just in the world. That used to be a thing in the church. It's, oh, it's the worldly problem. Guess what? It's found its way into the church. And how did we go from a place where in, in 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How do we go from a place where God said, I give you a sound mind, to a place where we've got pastors killing themselves? Large churches of thousands of people with every resource they could possibly have. And yet they're finding themselves with a gun next to their head. How did we get there? How did we find ourselves into a place where what we think doesn't line up with what God told us it should line up with? It doesn't say that we could have a spirit or or, or that we could have power, we could have love, and we could have a sound mind. He said he gave it to us. Now, that's interesting because the scripture is talking about, like, if I walked up and gave you a $100 bill right now in your hand, it's your job to go out and spend it, correct? Yes. It's nothing but a piece of paper if you, do no, anything, if you don't do anything with it. So here we have, a, we have an idea that God said, I've given you all of the ability. I've given you all of the things that could give you the power to think right, to think properly. As a matter of fact, if you translate sound mind into Greek, which the, all, the entire New Testament was written in Greek, and you translate it, it, it comes from two different words. It's, it's And put together, the word put together is sophrenio, which literally means a salvaged and protected mind. 
No, it, it means rescued. It means brought back. It means life breathed into it as one part of it. And the second of it is that it's not only been rescued, but it's been given the ability to be protected, given the ability to be shielded, given the ability to, to uh, hold on to like this with God's hands if we allow it. But how do we get to a place where our thoughts are so out of control and our thoughts are so this way and that way? As a matter of fact, the Bible says a, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways when we think this way and that way. But yet God says, I want you to think this way. How many of y'all remember in, in, in school said the fastest way from point A to point B is a straight line? See, God gave us the idea to have a straight line in our thoughts. He gave us the ability to have a straight line in the way that we process what's going on in the world. And let me tell you right now, if you turn on social media, you turn on the news, you turn on anything, it's just bombarding with frustration, bombarding with aggravation. Drive down 696 for five minutes, and I guarantee you, you will want to punch somebody. <laughs> Drive 75 when they're about to start all of the, the new construction. You're going to get mad. There's going to be frustration. But what happens what about these people that are jumping out of their car and ramming the other ones and pulling guns on each other? Something has gone awry. Yeah. Something has changed. Something has gone from an a, a idea of civility and an idea of peace into a place of, uh, of dysfunction, into a place of just frustration and anger. So how do we get rid of that? That's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about some practical steps to take us from this place to that place because you honestly believe that God's plan for our lives is to be angry and frustrated and hate each other for our skin color and hate it. What if we all work together? What if we were one team? What if we were all in one body like the body of Christ says? You know, the Bible says that what if the, the elbow and the ankle fought all the time we wouldn't be a body and that's what we're experiencing now what if we all were in unity what if our way of thinking mirrored christ just think about that because god cares about all of our being he cares about our thoughts his plan for us never included suicide his plan for us never included depression. His plan for us never included anxiety. His plan for us never included all of these uh, functions inside of us that are causing us to get to the point of suicide. As a matter of fact, God's plan for us in this life is for freedom. Jesus said, I came to give you freedom, freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from comparison. Anybody ever struggled with looking at somebody else or looking on social media? Man, their life is all together. And you better ever seen that guy drive up in a Ferrari. You know, he rented it. But you're like, man, that guy's got it all together. That's his daddy's car, you know. But we compare ourselves. We say we're not good enough. We don't reach it. We don't, we don't, we don't look that way. It's been in the church for years, too. I don't look like I'm a good enough Christian, so therefore I'm not one. I don't look like I act right, so therefore I'm not one. And as a matter of fact, you might be on the other side where they don't look right, so they're not one. Comparison is a terrible functionality in our human process. Because the last time I checked, God had a plan for you and you and you and you, and it all looks different because you're the best you you can ever be. As a matter of fact, I remember failing because I tried to be somebody I was not. And it was when I became my person that I began to win in life or I began to have what God wanted me to have. When I quit trying to be something I was not, I'm six foot tall, and guess what? I loved basketball, and I was a great basketball player. But there's not a lot of room for a six foot tall, overweight, white guy uh, in the NBA. <laughs> guess what? It didn't work. So if I'd have been sitting around trying to be that, it would not have worked. I had to find what worked for me. I was listening to a preacher the other day, and he, he just made, I mean, it made me laugh so much because he was talking about the same comparison idea. And he said if you, he had a Suburban at home that, that had, all his kids could fit in. He could put bicycles in and all of these things. And he said, but if you take a Formula One race car, you can go hundreds of miles an hour in a Formula One race car, but there's no luxury to it. It's very non-functional for a family. And he said, if you ever put a Suburban on a Formula One racetrack, they would lose quickly and vice versa. You could never drive a Formula One race car on the normal streets because it's not built for that. 
And so there's certain things that you're not built for. But on the flip side, there is certain things that you are built for. And I want to talk to you today about finding a way to get to the thing that God called you to be, that God called you to have. See, God has a plan for each and every one of you in your life. And I don't care what you've thought about yourself. And I don't care what people have ever told you. Because guess what? When people speak about you, sometimes they don't have your best interest in mind. Actually, it's most of the time. See, God said you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God said he knew you before you were formed in the womb, and he had a plan for you. He said he had plans of peace and not of evil, plans of hope, a future, an expected end. That's what he said about you and you and you. He didn't say that you're a failure. He never told you that. People have told you that. You've told yourself that. You have told yourself that. The enemy has bombarded your head and told you that you're a failure and that you're a loser and you'll never matter and never amount to anything. God said you're more than a conqueror because he loved you. Today, I want to talk about a bunch of C's and I'm going to use a lot of C words. And I use it like this so that you can begin to understand and learn and remember. Because there's something about remembering. The Bible in the New Testament says remember more than, I think it's 150 times, he says, remember this. And again, it's your job. God didn't say, I'm going to make you remember. God said, you have to take some steps and some effort to remember. Remember this. So when I say these C words, we're going to begin to talk about some practical ways to go from this place over here, this place of the land of less than enough into the land of more than enough into the land of less than enough and the way we think and the functionality of our brains into the land of more than enough so we can think like God thinks, so we can think like Jesus thinks that when he says our thoughts more than a 100 times in the New Testament, he said, think on these things that are good. Think on these things that are pure. He tells you over and over and over. So how do we get from here to here very practically? That's where we're going to go. Now, our first C is this. And it's in your outline. It says, we must bring clarity to the clutter to promote a closeness with our creator. Now, when I begin to think about this, anybody ever seen one of those, uh, that show uh, Hoarders? Anybody ever seen that? Does that not just make your skin crawl? I I don't know. I I mean, if if you're good with it, sorry, I I apologize. It just, it literally, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, that house literally is going to eat me from this television screen. I'm afraid it's going to jump out like some horror movie or something and, like, begin to eat me. But, uh, you know, there's, like, stacks of papers over here, and there's, like... Yesterday's donuts over here, last week's donuts maybe, I don't even know, but there's, there's all of this clutter everywhere. And anybody who's ever struggled with anxiety, and again, we're talking about uh, the way we think, if you've ever struggled with anxiety and worry and fear, all of that just, oh my goodness. And trust me, my nerves don't handle that very well. And I'm like just sitting there shaking and looking at this. But so often, that's the way our brains are. We've allowed the devil to come in and bombard us from this side and this side and that side. And we've got a stack of un- unfulfilled emotions over here. And we've got a stack of hurt over here. And coincidentally, I love this statement. And you've got this big stack of scars that, that are in our brains. And I-, I was reading this the other day, and it just really hit home because I've known it in the past. But it said, if you don't heal the things that have hurt you, you're going to bleed on those who didn't cut you. And so you got this stack of hurts and emotions here, the scars and these tears that maybe not were not your fault, but they're over here. And you got fear and anxiety over here, and you got worry over here, and you got this coming in and bills coming in, and all of a sudden you got this big stack of nothing. You're standing in the middle, and there's no pathway to clarity anywhere because it's just so cluttered up with all kinds of nonsense. And so today, I want to begin to clear a path in our brains. I want to begin to clear a path in our hearts so that we can begin to think like God thinks. And we can begin to put the things, the papers, in the proper filing cabinet. And we can begin to hand these things to God that need to be handed to God. And we can begin to clean this house out because God gave you that house. God didn't give you a house full of clutter. As a matter of fact, if I'm reminded right, the the New Testament scripture says that if we clear the house of the demons and we don't take care of it, they come back in sevenfold and begin to fill it back in. Because we got to begin to clear our house. Our house starts here. Our house starts in our brain, in our mind. 
Again, I'm going to say this again. We must bring clarity to the clutter to promote a closeness with our creator. Now, clarity is very important. Again, it's to give us that pathway. He said he came to give you a sound mind, not a jagged mind, not a mind that thinks over here and thinks over here and thinks over here. Again, I said it earlier, a double-minded man or woman is unstable in all of its ways. Anybody ever heard the word division? And it, sometimes they use it in the church. Anyway, that, that actually translates into two visions. It means that you have two ways of thinking. You can have division in your own head. And God has asked that we begin to think like him and not two ways. Because it's real easy to start thinking like I want to think. It's real easy to begin to think like I want to think. When really and truly, God says, I've given you a new way of thinking. Right? Amen. Amen. And clutter will always lead us to destruction. Because guess what happens when you're locked in a place of clutter? And there's, you can't go forward. You can't go sideways. You can't go back. You can't, or you can't go this way. You can't go back. Guess what happens? Checkmate. There's somebody who has a plan and a strategy for your life, and they want you to be still. God says be still before him, but it's so that you can be empowered to move for him. Yes. The enemy wants you still so that you can't do anything, and so that you're ineffective, so that you're ineffective in your worship, so that you're ineffective in your prayer life, so you're ineffective in your service life, so you're ineffective in your friend's life, so you're ineffective in your love life, so you're ineffective in your patience life, so you're ineffective in the fruits of the Spirit. God, I mean, the enemy wants you standing here so that you're ineffective. As a matter of fact, if you read the entire New Testament, everything is about growth, some kind of growth. We see that in, in the New Testament, of course, it's not in your outline, but, when, but the... God or the servant was given, uh, the three servants, they were given the talents, the ten, the five, the one. The two that went and did something with it were honored by God. The one that sat still and buried it because he was afraid or that he buried his talent or he stood still. He didn't do any action with it. He didn't make anything happen. He didn't step forward with it. It was taken from him. See, the entire New Testament is about action. And so we're going to talk about how to get into action. The first C of cleaning up the clutter is a very important thing, and this is where you have to start. Because let me tell you, I'm not taking anything lightly about mental illness or mental challenges because I've been there. I know what it's like. I've had to spend the last year fighting for my son. I've had to watch him die on me multiple times in that time. I've had to watch my wife have a seizure in the, in, the, in, the, in the room while I'm sitting there trying to block my son from seeing my wife. So I'm not talking to you something that I haven't walked through. I'm not talking to you something that, that when I was 17 years old, I almost went crazy and cracked up because I didn't know how to act. I'm not talking to you something that, that I haven't walked through myself or there's been a plan of action or a, pr a pro process that I walked through. So I'm going to talk to you some things that God gave me and some nuggets that God gave me to walk, to begin to make a way in that clutter, to begin to put things in the right place. And I had to start with compassion. Now I'm going to read this scripture. It says Colossians 3, 2, and I'm using the message, and I'm jumping into different translations of the Bible because I want, I want everyone to know that just one Bible isn't right. They're all different accounts of, of the way that God speaks in different words. And so we can use every one because they've all got pretty much the same concept. Some of them use a little bit different words than we're used to, like the King James and things. But I'm using the message. And it says, so chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. And he starts, the first thing he says is compassion. Now there's a couple more things as the scripture goes on. I'm using half of it because I, I want to stop with compassion. And that's usually a very unilateral word, I mean, a, a, single, a singular word where we think of compassion as what people show to others. Am I wrong? But God said, put on the clothes of compassion. He's making a bigger a, a, a change here. He's not just saying that you have to be somebody of compassion as you give out, but that you need to wear the coat of compassion. 
which means it covers you as well. People who have struggled with challenges in their brain, they usually forget to show compassion to themselves. And it starts with you. It's really hard to give true compassion out to somebody else when you can't forgive yourself. When you can't look at yourself and say, you know what, I may not be good today, but I'm going to be there one day. Jesus said, or the disciple came to Jesus and said, how many times did you forgive? And of course, the, all the mass scholars have tried to figure out what that means because he says 70 times 7, which means God times God infinity. And in, 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 he's saying, as many times as you could possibly forgive your neighbor, you, you're supposed to. But it's also about ourselves. How many times have you made a mistake and you've forgotten to forgive yourself? And then... That next time you're so scared to do something that you forget to step out when God said, hey, go talk to that person about my my love. And then it's real hard because all of a sudden, yeah, man, I screwed up last time. I messed up that last time. Or or that better better on this, this terminology way, you forget to forgive yourself. And then it's real easy to get mad at the other people who are talking to you or your boss or your, or your pastor or your pastor comes to you and talks to you about something and says, hey, you know, like maybe we ought to try this. You know, we're trying to work on, on steps towards Jesus. And you, he says something to you and you're like, you know, you, you start putting your knucks up. You want to give him the fist, you know, because all of a sudden there's this frustration because you forgot to forgive yourself. You forgot to show yourself compassion You forgot to show yourself that God forgot about it when you simply say, God, I'm sorry. Help me do better next time. That's one of the most powerful prayers you can ever pray. Sorry, Lord, help me do better next time. I dare you to start praying that prayer when you mess up because he'll help you. You start showing humility. You start showing compassion to yourself. But, you know, if it's you... I dare you to look yourself in the mirror at times and say, I forgive you because I had to do that myself. I know that sounds stupid and I know that sounds irrational, but I had to look in the mirror and look at me and I say, I forgive you because I just couldn't forgive myself. I was too worried about the mistakes I've made. I was too worried about the the problems I'd caused. I was too worried about all the things that I eat. Some of it was just self-thought, you know, like I was so awful because I did this when a lot of it's not even true. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's truth where people put a lot of pressure on you that's not true, but I just had to forgive myself and had to work through that. So clearing up the clutter was beginning to forgive myself, and all of a sudden I took the stack that was over here of all these papers and all these rem- memories of you messed up here and you did that and you did that and you did that and this list of, of all of the mess-ups and failures that I had, and I was like Peter who... All of a sudden, God saved me, and I had this incredible energy and excitement that I'm walking on, the, on, the, on water. And all of a sudden, I got my face turned onto these things that I messed up and I sunk. How many of you are sinking today because you can't forgive yourself? What about returning to the joy of your salvation? The second C of cleaning up the clutter. And this is a very practical one, but this is another one where people begin to lose, is we got to create a game plan. We have to genuinely create a game plan in our life to attack that clutter. I'm using the scripture here, Proverbs 29, 18. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. If we don't have a focal point, if we don't have a place or something we're driving to be or driving to do, if we don't have something to achieve in our life, even it's as, if it's as little as, you know what, I want the fruits of the Spirit to abound in my life. It's huge. I say little because a lot of people don't see the difference. They think that they're looking for the big miracles of God and they miss the miracle of God that God is with us and he begins to work through us and work out of us. But we will perish if we have no place of vision, if we have no place of purpose, if we have no drive to be something that is different than here, because our tomorrows will be better than our todays if we allow him to be in charge of that. You know, the the Israelite people walked around in the wilderness, and sometimes we just get stuck in the wilderness, 
And we're okay with the wilderness because our shoes never, if you know the, uh, the illustration, I don't have time to go into it, but if you know the illustration, their shoes never wore out and they never had to worry about food, but they weren't in the land of more than enough. They weren't in everything that God called them to be. And so often we just get stuck where we're comfortable. We've got to have a game plan to get out of the, move from Egypt into the wilderness and then into God's best. And so when we create a game plan for our life, I'm using three more C's here, and it's in your outline. It says it must be calculated. And what that word means, it must be thought out. It must be well thought out. Again, I could have all the dreams in the world of being an NBA player, but it was just not in the cards. That would not have been a well calculated game plan. But in 2015, when, or actually probably like 2014 when it was, and I looked at God and all of a sudden, you know, Gideon wasn't near as sick as he, he was, but he was sick in a different way at that time. I was pretty much homebound with, I mean, I, I had a very hard job that I was working with. I would just go to work, come home. I never, I, I wasn't able to do what God called me to do, which is being the, I love being part of the church. I love being part of the ministry. And I had, I was on the sidelines for a little while and I looked at God and I said, God, did you pass me by? I said, God, is this, is this all there ever is? And I had to look at myself and say, you know what? I'm happy with it. If this is all I ever have, I will be the greatest father I can ever be, and I will be the greatest husband I can ever be, and I will give everything I have into doing that. Amen. I had a game plan. I had a purpose. I had a vision. It was calculated. Here's the other thing. It must be conformable. It's easily conformed to be a best father and a best husband. And what I mean by conformable is sometimes you fall into, uh, like, if you've ever been on a GPS and it's taking you somewhere and all of a sudden you run in, all of a sudden the road's closed. Have you ever been there? And you have to jut around it. It's a little frustrating. But you still make it to the, your destination. It was just a little bit around. You know, it, it can be conformable. My point is, there's times when we have to ju uh, make a little adjustment in there, but it needs to be conformable, but you still need to have a vision, you still need to be calculated, and then it must be conceivable, meaning that you must, you must know that you can get it. It needs to be thought out and say, you know what, I can reach that goal. It's got to be conceivable. And we're, because we're talking about what's going on in your brain. We're not talking about, um, it, when God gives plans, God gave us the plan around here in the church to, to have a new building. And, and it wasn't something that all of a sudden we just woke up one day and thought, oh, this is a great idea. As a matter of fact, we could have done it years ago if that was a great idea, but we had to wait on God. See, now that may not completely be conceivable because sometimes God says step out in faith and sometimes God says those kind of things, but I'm talking about a practical way to get from point A to point B in our thought life. So these are two totally different concepts. This is apple and oranges. So just to clarify that, we're talking about your personal game plan. We're talking about a game plan that can say, I can reach that goal. It might just be paying attention to our, our LC essentials. You know, some of you, your goal might just to be a disciple. It might just to be a, a, a better Christian, I should say. That's not really a great word. We'll get in that in a minute because a lot of people, that brings up a lot of weird thoughts when you say the word disciple. But it might just be to be a Christian. How do I get to the point of being a Christian? Well, we've got to have a game plan. You've got to have a way to get there. It needs to be calculated, conformable, and conceivable. Like, you know, it's not, it's not pr pr practical for somebody to get saved today and say, you know what, I'm going to be the great, world's greatest Christian tomorrow. As a matter of fact, Paul had a problem. He had been serving God for years, and he said, I do the things that I don't want to do, and I, do, I don't want to do things I do want to do. It's not practical to be the world's greatest Christian. But what is practical is love, peace, joy. What about the fruits of the Spirit? What, what if that's your game plan? What about your game plan may just be that I'm just not as anxious today as I was yesterday. Amen. And what's interesting is the New Testament, God says, he says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry for itself. For if I clothe the grass of the field, I clothe the air, I mean, the, the birds in the air, how much more will I clothe my servants? He didn't even leave it up for interpretation. He said, don't worry about it. You know, we, we go around, we're like, well, does God speak into me? Is God ever going to talk to me? 
Yeah, he told you don't worry about it. He literally said don't worry about it. So guess what job is yours now? We got some scholars in here today. Don't worry about it. I didn't come up with it. That's not in First Stephen. It sounds, see, we make Christianity so much harder than it is. We really do. We try to come in and add all of these layers into it, and we're trying to, you know, like bring it to this level of, of whatever it is, and it's really nothing more than uh, we end up becoming religious out of it instead of just understanding the simplicity of the gospel. See, Jesus had a game plan. It was pretty interesting. He said, I'm going to come on this earth. I'm God in flesh. I'm going to wait until it's time. He was very humble. He walked in the fruits of the Spirit. He lived his life very calculated. He lived his life very conformable. There was times when he couldn't even preach in certain places because their faith, or he couldn't heal in certain places because their faith wasn't enough. There were sometimes he was going over here and God would direct him over here. It was conformable. It was conceivable because you know what? When it was time, he went to the cross and guess what? You're sitting here today because that plan was calculated, conformable, conceivable. There's a game plan for Jesus. Now we have to have a game plan for ourselves, and I can't figure that out for you. Pastor Terry can't figure that out for you. You have to figure your game plan out for you. Again, my game plan became, became am, I can be the best father I can be, and I can be the best husband I can be, and every one of my decisions begin to ro- revolve around those two things. Everyone. So if you're a man and you have children, I dare you to be the best father you can ever be. If you have a spouse, be the best husband you could possibly be. And guess what? Do it without strings attached. I dare you to do it without strings attached. I dare you to start doing it the way God asked for you to do it. Because he says he'll repay you. When you do it for man, you get a man's reward. But when you do it for God, you get God's reward. I dare you to have a game plan that will radically change this world. Good morning, church. Today we're going to look at Haggai chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. It says, Then the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look what's happening to you. You planted much, but you harvest little. You eat, but you're not satisfied. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you're putting them in pockets filled with holes. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look what's happening to you. Now go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it, and I will be honored, says the Lord. This is the story of God wanting Israel to build a new temple in Jerusalem. Many of the people didn't see a need for a new building. They were focused on their own homes and their own needs, and they didn't consider the needs of God's house. God said to them, look what's happening to you. The enemy's stealing from you. It's like you're putting your money in pockets that are filled with holes. You work a lot, but you have little to show for it. This is what happens when we support our own needs without supporting the needs of God's house. When you support the house of God, you're positioning yourself for blessing. The holes in your pockets will get sewed up. The seeds you plant will begin to bring forth a a bountiful harvest, and you will find much greater satisfaction and fulfillment in your life. Now go up to the hills. Let's bring down some timber and build a better house for God. There's several ways for you to give. If you'd like to give electronically, please visit the website on the screen below. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray for our eyes to be open. Lord, for us to begin to see things your way, Lord. For us to begin to understand the principles of giving and receiving. Lord, for us to to understand how you want to bless us through this wonderful principle, Lord. God, that you are desiring for us to build a better house for you together. Lord, whether we think it's right or not, God, it's what's right for you, for you to be honored, Lord, and for your kingdom to be furthered and exalted, Lord God. 
So God, we stretch forth our faith today and we go up into the mountains and we bring down the timbers of finances to build your house, Lord God. Together, through us, you can do great things in this community. Use us, we say, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. The third C of cleaning up the clutter. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is fourth and one on the one yard line waiting to score a touchdown to win the Super Bowl. Just hope you're not the Seattle Seahawks from a few years ago. So we're not talking about the Lions here because we're talking about, no, sorry. I love the Lions, don't, no, no, I'm just, anyway. Maybe if, they got, maybe if they got this down, we might be talking about a different story. Anyway, the third C of cleaning up the clutter is be committed and consistent. Again, see, I told you. I was talking about the Lions. See? Well, they need to be consistent and committed to winning. Romans 12.2. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, this is a super powerful scripture. And I've, I've heard it preached many times. I've heard people say stuff. But it usually comes in the form of don't drink, don't chew, and don't date the girls that do. It comes in this idea that that's the pattern of the world. It's all just this like idea that if you do that, then you're going to hell, and that's the end of it. When that's really, if you translate this in Greek, you'll understand that it literally doesn't mean that. It says, do not conform. Remember that whole idea that I was just talking about where our plans have to be conformable? But now we're talking about when we're committed or being consistent to this plan, we don't need to conform or move ourselves around the ways of the world. But we need to be transformed and renew our minds. Now, the difference between those words are conformity means that you make a way to go around something. Transform means you make a way to go through something. And that's, that's what's different about this, as he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. But the pattern of this world is bigger than just the sin that people try to make it out to be. It's w much larger. It's much more complicated. Because again, the way of the world is to worry about to, for tomorrow, right? I love and I believe completely in a lot of our programs that, the, that society has. And so please don't, don't mess this up. But I have had people try to sell me more life insurance out of fear because they said, what if you die? What if you die tomorrow? What if you walked out of here and die? As a matter of fact, I have a preacher try to tell me to receive Jesus, even though I was already saved. They just didn't know any better. What if you walked out there and died? Now, those are good concepts, and I'm not trying to knock on them, but they're using fear to try to bring something to you. You might need it, but don't use fear. The Bible says don't worry about it. God's got you. See, you don't want to conform the way, your way of thinking to the pattern of the world. The pattern of the world is be scared about everything. Am I wrong? Every week, we've got a new baby seat coming out that has a different harness, that has, and you've got to buy this new baby seat, and they're $400 or whatever they are, because your baby's going to die. I, I've been through it. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. And it's like, wait a second. The only thing different is the clasp is made by a different plastic. I've, I've, been, I've been susceptible to this. So I'm, t I'm just talking to myself about how dumb I was and wasted my money because I gave into it, okay? I conform my way to a pattern of the world, which means we use fear, we use manipulation. The world uses those things to control you. But God says, I want to use love. I want to use care. I want to use forgiveness. I want to die on the cross so that you have peace. So that you have love and of power and a sound mind. So the pattern of this world is that your mind is not sound. So when we're breaking, we've got to transform that. We can't conform ourselves to that. 
Because if we, really, we, if we really translate this the way that the world and even some churches teach, and I'm not hitting on all churches because I, 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 as long as they're preaching Jesus, I think we can work together. That's not the thing. I'm just, but I, I've heard him actually preach this stuff. And what it would really translate is, for God has not given us a, a spirit of fear, but of weakness and of hate and of a silly mind. Because it says conform to the world. And they do. They conform their preaching. They conform their, their functionality. They conform the way they treat each other to the ways of the world. But we are supposed to transform our mind. And what does it say? That you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Now, some translations actually say transform like uh, by, the, by the renewing of the word, it's not just renewing your mind. It talks about the word of God and how to get the word of God in there. So again, renewing of your mind. I got to break this down really quick. I know I don't got to move. I know you guys are getting antsy and hungry. Um, <laughs> this is food here. Come on now. Some of you guys can give me another hour. Come on, please, please. <laughs> Renewing is a great word because that word begins to talk about a consistency and a commitment to the over and over and over again. It doesn't mean one time. Your spirit gets saved when you acknowledge Jesus. Your brain doesn't. Let's face it. So guess, who needs, guess what needs to get saved over and over and over and over? Your brain. And I don't mean, you know, like sitting here. I'm saying that as a, as a simple, because the idea of saved means salvation. Salvation trans, literally translates to being the earliest form known idea in Greek of salvation is idea of Tarzan coming down and swooping down and finding Jane and swinging out. It's No, I'm, I'm serious. It, it talks about the, a jungle warrior who, who reached down and found the love of his life and rescued her out of a pit of, of, uh, uh, of like animals or something. I forgot how it went, but they were attacking her, and he reached out. And that's the earliest form known of idea of the word salvation. It means to be rescued. It means to be rescued by somebody up above to come down and salvage you out of a pit of things trying to attack you. So when we see the word saved or salvation, that's, you can also be understood there. So we have to have that in our, in, in, in our minds. And anyway, so that you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Now, this is why we have to be com committed and consistent to the plan of God. Is because guess what? How many of you have ever been tested in your mind? Anybody? How many of you loved quizzes in school? My hand is only up because I'm trying to get you to agree with me because I hated them. I hated quizzes. I hated testing. I hated all of those things. I, I always did good on them, but I didn't care to do good on them because they're just frustrating me. And so, you know, I didn't like sitting there. But we have to be able to test and approve what, the, what God's will is. And it, does, it means, it, it, and that word test means to achieve or to pass the test. It doesn't just mean you can put it up against the word of God. It means you, you're actually succeeding. You're actually fulfilling that concept. So when we don't conform to the pattern of the world, but we transform our mind or we begin to break through and we have the straight point from A to B, we will begin to prove that God's word and his will is good and pleasing and perfect. See, it's really hard. What's interesting, I try to lay all this groundwork so you could understand. It's really hard to, to prove to your friends or the people that your sphere of influence that the will of God is working in your life when even your thoughts don't line up with God's. Isn't that interesting? I, I believe in Acts I'm not, I believe, I know it's there, but I'm saying this, so if you've, if you've ever read this, there's a key scripture. He said, when the Spirit of the Lord has come upon you, you shall be my witness. It doesn't say you could be, you might be, it might be things. It doesn't say that. It said you shall be, because all of a sudden when the Spirit of the Lord comes on you and you begin to function in that, you become that witness, and all of a sudden you're from point A to point B, and you quit conforming yourself and making all of these things around these areas of your life that you know are not supposed to be conformed to. It might be the person you're living with, and you, or it might be a job that you know is not right, or it might be something 
that you've never gotten over, like the scars and you're bleeding on people that you shouldn't bleed on, or it might just be religion in the church where you absolutely treat everybody wrong because you think you have it all figured out and you're nothing more than a judge and God doesn't care about that because he's the judge of all judges and you're not one. He didn't give you that right. Jesus said that we're all color, covered red in the, under his blood and he's all working on us at the same point. And guess what? We didn't all get on the right race at the same time. Some people got on a lot further back than you did and you can't turn around and say they're not on the track just because you're a lot further along. Here we go. It's very important to be a disciple or have discipline. You know, a lot of words we talk about committed and consistent would be a discipline. A discipline simply is the actions of a disciple. So if you're talking about the disciples in the Bible, use their actions, and that would be discipline. Or discipline is the training that corrects, molds, or perfects the mental faculties or even moral character. Well, we know it's hard to have moral character if your mind is not in the right place. It's really hard to have a certain way of act, acting. Otherwise, people call them hypocrites, right? When they're acting like somebody. And it's really hard to continue doing something that you don't think right, and, so, and you're doing something completely opposite of what you think. You, you feel fake. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I've been there, and that's a real problem. So moving on to the last and most important thing. Again, we've got three things that we've had is you need to have compassion on yourself. So remember that. Remember to wear the coat of compassion, not just for other people, but yourself. Second is create a game plan. Find out what it is that you want to be and you want to do with God, not necessarily for God, but with God, because God wants, he said, in him we live and move or have our being. So don't forget that, that we need to do it with him and in partnership with him. Then third, be committed and consistent to that game, game plan, because you don't want to be the Detroit Lions in your spiritual walk. And, well, it's true. Every year they've got a new coach or every year they've got a new this or new that. They, they, they never can figure out a way to win. Have a game plan that wins here. And I don't care if you call them cheaters or not. The Patriots every year figure out how to win when they're under talented, when they're this, when they're that. They've got every reason to not do it and they still do it. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, think about that in your life. The right game plan wins. You have, and I don't, I've got to go into this real quick because if you look at this last Super Bowl, um, Tom Brady is known for his passing. He's known for all of these things. And instead, all they did is run the ball and they won like 13 to three. That's so untypical of the New England Patriots, but their game plan worked. Winning is done in the game plan and the consistency to that game plan. If they hadn't have practiced properly, if they hadn't have thought of it properly, and they hadn't have made every, they had to shift their entire offense so that they won. And guess what? They still won. So what if you have to do a little shifting in your life? Guess what? The Bible says sometimes we have to give up and sacrifice our own plans. We have to give and sacrifice our own feelings. Sorry about it. But it hurts sometimes when we, when we change our way of we're thinking. But this is, this is the part I really wanted to get to today. And this is the fourth C of cleaning up the clutter. And this is carbon. Now you might say, what on earth? And why is he talking about carbon? Carbon is a cast off. When we light logs on fire, or we make fire, carbon is usually like this little like black stuff that comes off. And it's real easy to look at the carbon and say, wow, that's trash. That's worthless. It's real easy to just throw it away, right? But the truth is, is we can't write with a number two pencil without carbon. There's things over and over that are made out of carbon. And actually, there's one thing that's highly valuable that's made out of carbon. As a matter of fact, mo almost everybody who's married, if you look in the wife's ring, you're going to find something that's made out of carbon mixed with pressure. You can't have a beautiful diamond in your life without a little pressure. But the secret is you've got to look at those remnants and you've got to look at the leftovers in your life. And I'm daring you right now to stop right where you're at. And if you want to ever make clarity in the clutter, you've got to find the carbon. You've got to find the cast off. And you've got to start handing it to God and say, God, 
here's, here's my pressure. And allow God to start squishing his hands on that carbon and begin to put that pressure on you and to begin to put that little functionality on you. And all of a sudden, you begin with a ring of beauty. See, I dare you to look in your life today. I dare you to look in all those dreams that you've given up on. I dare you to look at yourself, and and this might be young people who say, you know what, I can't do anything because I'm not good enough. It might be somebody who's older or a saint and said, you know what, I can't do anything because I got life has passed me by. I dare you to take that carbon and begin to give it to God today. I dare you to take that carbon in your life of all those hurts and pains and say, you know what, I've been cast off. I've been forgotten. My dad did X to me. My mom did X to me. My boyfriend left me. My, my, my husband left me and left me, but nothing but a pile of ashes. But you know what? God causes carbon to rise up out of those ashes, and he causes diamonds to begin to rise up out of those ashes when we take our ashes and put it before God and say, God, use me. Take me from here to here to here. He can take you if you begin to grab in those ashes and begin to grab in all of that clutter and say, you know what, God, I don't have the strength to do this. Guess what? He said it's not in your strength that he's made worthy. He said it's in your weakness that he is made worthy. Grab down in your weakness. Reach down inside of you and say, you know what, I don't care what I've been faced with. I don't care what the world has hit me with. I don't care what side of the tracks I was born on. I don't care I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I don't care I don't look like the part. But God, here are my ashes. Take it and make a ring on my finger of beauty. Begin to renew my mind. Begin to let me see that I'm more than enough. He said you're more than a conqueror because he loved you. He said you're the head and not the tail. The top and not the bottom. You're the victor and not the victim. The conqueror and not the conquered. Your yesterdays are not your tomorrows. Your forgotten days and your pain and your suffering doesn't have to be what you're going to be tomorrow. I've watched people walk out of the worst situations in their life, rise up and be kings and queens in this world. Your circumstances are not limited by God. And God is not limited by your circumstances. What you are limited by is whether you're willing to take all the pain all the suffering and all the clutter and say, you know what? Here, God. And when are you going to do it? It's not my job to do it for you. As a matter of fact, I could never do it for you. It's not your spouse's job to do it for you. It's not your boyfriend's job. It's not the pastor's job. It's not your boss's job. It's not your skin color's job. It's not the government's job. It's not anybody's job but you. You get down on your knees and you say, you know what, God, I know I'm broken. But guess what? Through my weakness, you will be made known. The last C of cleaning up the clutter in your brain is to simply remember, simply take all those things and all of those, thi- all those hurts that you've been bleeding on others with. Because here's what's going to happen. When you quit bleeding on others for pain and you turn that into the love of God for others, people that never would know Jesus begin to see the love of God And people that would never step foot in a church begin to know the redemptive power of God. And we talk about miracles. And I tell you what, we're looking for healing. We're looking for lightning from heaven. But there's nothing more of a miracle than the time that somebody says, you know what? I'm not my own, but I'm Jesus come in my heart. That's the greatest miracle there is. 